Raymond, we're going live. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Miami Beach Urban Studios Live Art Talk. Today, we are with Washington, D.C.-based artist Lynn Myers. My name is Colette Mello. Thank you all for joining us this evening. I'd like to thank Miami Beach Department of Tourism and Office of Cultural Affairs for sponsoring these art talks. Lynn Myers' ephemeral site responsive works have been shown in public venues, including the Hirschhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden in Washington, D.C., the Hammer Museum in Los Angeles, the Phillips Collection in Washington, D.C., the Tokyo Metropolitan Museum of Art in Tokyo, Japan, the Corcoran Museum of Art in Washington, D.C., the Smithsonian American Art Museum in D.C., the Drawing Center in New York City, the National Museum of, Wa of Women in, of the Arts in Washington, D.C., and Jason Hom's Seoul, South Korea, Paris Concrete in Paris, France, and others. Myers is a recipient of numerous awards and fellowships, including the Smithsonian Artist Research Fellowship, the Pollock Krasner Award, a Santo Foundation Award, and five DC Commission on the Arts grants. She's been an artist in residence at the Hirshhorn Museum in DC, the San Jose Institute of Contemporary Art in California, and the Bullinglin Arts Foundation in Ireland, just to name a few. She is also the co-founder of the Stable Complex, Complex that provides affordable studio space to artists in Washington, DC. Myers holds a BFA from the Cooper Union and an MFA from the California College of the Arts. I'd like to take this opportunity to remind everyone that if you have any comments or questions to make them through our chat function and we'll try to get to them throughout our conversation with Lynn. Lynn, thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to hand the screen over to you now. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Colette. Um, thank you, Colette, um, for working with me uh, for the past bunch of months to make this happen. Um, and Raymond, thank you for your tech um, assistance. And Jennifer Prince, I see you're on the call and I understand that you had put my name in the hat for this. So thank you so much for that. Um, I also wanted to acknowledge that I'm joining you from the ancestral lands of the Anacostans, which neighbors the ancestral lands of the Piscataway peoples. And I wanna thank the indigenous communities for their strength and resilience in protecting these lands. Um, I guess I'll start by sharing my screen. And um, what I'd like to do since it's a pretty small group is um, invite you to put conversations in the chat as I go along. So the Q&A doesn't need to happen just at the end. I'm happy to answer questions at the end, but if, you, if I miss something or if I kind of skim over something, um, please um, feel free to uh, put your questions in the chat and hopefully Colette can, um, can share that with me. Okay, so let's see. Oops, I gotta get up to this. I just wanna remind you, Lynn, you, um, to hit those two little buttons. Yeah, where were they again? At the see. bottom of the screen. I think it was audio and video. Is that right, Raymond? Yeah, you would have. Um, you would have to stop stop sharing your screen. Okay. Uh, and then reshare. It brings up a little pop up. Okay, so where do I find them? I'm. I apologize. So when you reshare your screen, um, brings up like a little pop up on the bottom left. Uh, click those two check boxes. Oh, that's right. It's right here. Okay, it's all checked, and I think we're ready to go. Okay. Um, 
So this is a, um, a detail of a large installation that I made at the Hirschhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden that I actually began installing exactly five years ago today. Um, but I'm gonna um, skip forward and show you some work. Um, oh goodness, I don't even know how to, how to advance to the next, uh, there should be like a button on the left hand side, an, a little arrow. Oh, yeah, I see it now. It's very great. Oh, okay. So I'm going to skip forward and talk to you about a project that I did um, that I started um, almost a year ago when um, COVID-19 was first declared a pandemic. And um, we uh, here in Washington on March 13th, the mayor declared a stay at home order. At the time, my studio was at Stable, which is um, which Colette mentioned in her introduction. Um, it's a studio complex. And, um, and so I assumed that the building would close down and that I would not be able to use my studio and that I would be working from my apartment. So um, I live in a pretty small apartment at the time my uh, my son was here and um, it was going to get crowded pretty quickly. So I tried, I tried to fit everything into a milk crate that I thought I would need. And I was assuming that the quarantine would last a couple weeks. Um, so these two books um, are um, from, they were printed in 1900. Um, and they contain images, um, etchings that are copies of Turner's paintings, along with text by John Ruskin um, about Turner's work. And I purchased them on the street in mm, probably 1986 or 87 in the East Village uh, because I love Turner's work. Um, and then I've dragged them around with me over the decades um, from one end of the country to the other trying to figure out how to use them. And I was always attracted to the uh, images inside. And I always thought that I would make something out of those pages. But I think what stopped me was the sense that I would be somehow sullying um, Turner's work. So I brought these home with me along with an X-Acto knife and some other basic materials, um, expecting to be quarantined for a couple of weeks and ended up, um, of course, not really working at Stable at that studio um, really again since then, um, and ended up moving my studio back to a different location where it had been for years before. Um, it's an isolated space, so I don't have to worry about COVID there. Um, but um, what I ended up doing with, the, with these books is, um, cutting out the majority of John Ruskin's text and creating these, I guess you could call them poems, I call them text production pieces um, that are reflective of the period that we were living in at that moment. Um, and um, all told, I think I made about um, 35 or 36 of these. Um, this one reads this period of severe longing, um, which of course relates to the time of the pandemic. Um, this one reads the actual work of nothing to do. So I continued making these. They're very outside of the work that I ordinarily do, but there are some interesting overlaps. Um, I think the most obvious one for me is that um, they're kind of an unsolicited collaboration with John Ruskin. So um, I did not ask his permission, obviously, to cut up his text. Um, but um, here's another one that came a little bit later. Silence is only broken by motion and change. Um, these works are, the titles of the works are the words in each piece. Most of my paintings and drawings are untitled. My site-specific works do have titles. Um, one of the things um, about this work that I love is, is the limitations. So um, 
you know, I was limited by the words that already existed on the page. And I was also limited by the reality that um, any words that I left on the page had to be kind of attached to the edge. Um, so I was limited by the original typesetting. Um, and it, it was interesting to me to be able to work with text because I hadn't really done that since I was in college. Um, so um, moving forward into the work that is probably um, more well known to some of you, this is a um, site specific piece that I made at the Phillips collection in 2010. And it was titled At the Time Being. It's part of a program that the museum had, they may still have, called Intersections, where they invite contemporary artists to respond to works from their permanent collection. So in this case, I, I asked them to hang this Van Gogh painting titled The Road Member, Menders um, between these two archways. And, um, and the work that I made was in response to, to Van Gogh's work in general, not specifically to this painting, but, um, but the, the palette of this painting certainly had an influence. Um, and with this piece, um, the um, visitors to the museum were asked to or needed to move into the gallery space to see the entirety of the image. The painting is about 10 feet tall and about 23 or 24 feet wide, I believe. So this piece was on view for about six months. All of my site-specific works are um, have a predetermined end date. So they, they sort of have an expiration date. And that's a really important um, part of these projects. And it was even more important or maybe even more magnified at the Phillips Collection where it was in a gallery next to works like The Boating Party and well-known works from earlier centuries um, that kind of brought the ephemerality of the piece into high relief. Lynn, when you are doing this work at the Phillips and you, and you chose this work by Van Gogh, does Van Gogh have a big influence on your work or what, did they give you an opportunity to like mine their collection sort of like Fred Wilson or? Exactly, yeah. So they gave me their, their catalog of works, which isn't, it's like, you know, almost like a black and white, nothing fancy um, catalog of all the works in the collection. Mm -hmm. And um, and essentially let me choose the work that I wanted to respond to. And they let me choose the gallery in which I did the piece. And I, I can't say that Van Gogh was a very heavy influence on my work prior to doing this. Um, I actually, I felt like I, I got to know him and his work so well while I was making this piece. And actually um, between I'd say around the early 2000s and the time when I made this painting, I was making almost exclusively drawings. So this piece actually brought me back into um, the world of painting. I was originally trained as a printmaker um, when I went to college, I thought I was going to become a printmaker. I worked in a print shop in New York City and um, found that the medium was a little bit too rigid for me as an artist. Um, I still love the processes and that's why I still have my hands in printmaking, but now I work with master printers. So um, the, but anyhow, to your question, um, I wouldn't say that Van Gogh was a huge figure in my mind, um, but he became more and more important to me um, ha having done this project. Um, this is a uh, image of a piece that I did at the Hammer Museum a year later um, in 2011. And so like with the last piece that I showed you, um, I was um, sort of riffing off of the Van, Van Gogh painting in this piece, I studied the architecture. I always study the architecture. I studied the movement of um, visitors to the museum through the space. And, um, and I also took into account the qualities of Los Angeles as a city, the qualities of light and activity there. 
And, um, and those were some of the things that I was thinking about as I was um, um, conceiving this piece. So this is about 70, 70 linear feet altogether. And I think at its highest point, it's about 23 feet. Um, you can kind of get a sense of the height. It's a little misleading. You can get a sense of the height by the doorway there. Um, this piece took me 12 days to complete working um, about 14 or 15 hours a day. And um, let's see. What's the medium on this? Is that um, paint or ink or? So the, the museum painted the wall for me. Um, and so that's just your standard wall paint. Um, mm -hmm. And then the lines are drawn with acrylic ink, which I apply with a graffiti pen. So um, many people are now familiar with these. They weren't that readily available when I made this piece, but now you can buy them in art supply stores. Um, there, it's like an empty magic marker and you can, you can fill up the, the marker with whatever material you want. So in my case, I use acrylic inks and I just mix them according to the project that I'm working on. And that's a detail. The lines are probably about an eighth of an inch thick. Um, this, so this is the Hirshhorn project. This, I, I made the scale of the mark much larger because the space is so much bigger. Um, so this piece is about uh, 400 linear feet long. Um, and um, let's see, it took me 65 days to complete. I was in the museum for 65 consecutive days. Um, each of the walls, it ranges between um, 45 and 55 feet long, and there are eight of them. Um, so I made preparatory drawings for each section. And, um, and then as I began the, and the, each preparatory drawing was based on a series of circles that kind of functioned as um, almost like a, almost like a matrix that the drawings were, um, were conceived around. So you'll see, I have, I think I have a picture of one of my preparatory drawings. So is that is that part of your process? Like with the Hammer Museum, did you have a preparatory, you did a site visit and then measured everything out? Is that? Yeah, normal? so when I do my site visits, I, um, you know, I obviously the museums provide um, elevations, scaled elevations. And then I, I bring those back to the studio along with my notes about the way that um, visitors move through the space and any other qualities that I pick up on. So the quality of light or um, you know, obstructions, strange quirks in the architecture, which are actually things that I, I enjoy rather than try to avoid. Um, and, um, and so um, the, the prep drawings generally are, I work on them for a number of months um, before I begin the actual work on site. So the prep drawings can take longer than the actual installation piece. Um, in this case, um, it, all the preparatory drawings had these had this um, geometry in them and we were able to just scale it up and quickly um, repeat it on the wall at scale from, from my little sketches. So I think you'll see something about that. Oh yeah, here. So this is one of my little preparatory drawings. I think it's like four, four inches tall or something. Um, and then the, the final wall that was based on that composition. So you can see how the, um, the quality of line changes, but there's still significant similarities. And sometimes I stray from the preparatory drawings. Um, in one of the pieces I'll show you this evening, I ended up um, redrawing some of them while I was working. Um, I'll show you this video really quick. So the, let me just try and lower the volume here. Um, so this, this, they did a time-lapse of this first wall. Um, this wall, I think it took me about 64 hours to complete. So what you're seeing is um, maybe a, a week and a half's worth, worth of work. Um, 
And at the time when I did this section of wall, the museum was closed. So I didn't have to worry about visitors. Um, I did about half of this installation while the second floor of the museum was closed and they were deinstalling the um, one show and installing the, um, um, the next coming show. And so the Robert Irwin show. And um, so for the first half of my installation, I had a lot of solitude, which was great because I was sort of just getting grounded in the space. And then for the second half of it, um, visitors were there watching me install, which was fine. I don't have a problem with that. In fact, I, I'm not a performer, but I like the idea that people, that you can sort of like open the curtain and allow um, visitors to the museum to see how a work like this actually gets made because it's, it's quite simple. I'm sure they loved it. Um, well, it was also served as a social media backdrop. So there's, <laughs> there's that also. So you, you just mentioned you don't consider your work performative. It's but your not, body is really involved in your work. I mean, these big swirls and movements, your body, right? Yeah, so it's very physical, mm -hmm. um, but I don't consider myself a performer. Um, this is just a very quick video that I want to share um, that the BBC took. They, they made a little documentary about the project and they took footage of the, um, the wall drawing being painted over. So generally I'm not around when that happens um, for no other reason than I don't work in the museum. And at that point, you know, I'm generally not even allowed back in there, but um, it's nice to see that happening because the, the, the fact that the work vanishes is very important to me. Um, this is an image of um, a piece called Let's Get Lost that I installed at the Bowdoin College Museum of Art in um, August, 2018. And this one was up for a year. The Hirshhorn piece was up the longest. I think it was, it was extended. It lasted about 18 months. So what was nice about that was that it coincided with not just the Robert Irwin show, but also the Yoyoi Kusama show and um, two other exhibitions which are escaping me right now. But that, that was really nice. Anyhow, I love that. Um, so this piece, like I said, is called um, Let's Get Lost. And um, it was, it, this is just a detail of, um, of the gallery. Which, so I had an oval shaped gallery to work in. Each wall um, had one of these niches um, and each composition differed a bit. Um, and there, besides collaborating with the existing architecture, there was a second piece of this project. Um, it was called Listening Glass. And that was actually a collaborative sound piece that I made with three other artists, um, James Garver, uh, Rebecca Bray, and um, Josh Knowles. Um, Jimmy Garver is a sound designer. Um, Rebecca Bray is an a, um, audience experience specialist and Josh Knowles writes software. And the four of us together created a sound piece that started out as an iPhone app and it's actually still available. So if any of you have an iPhone and you want to download it, it's free, it's called Listening Glass. And um, what we did was we basically turned the gallery into an instrument that people could play. Um, so this is a, um, let me see if I can turn this volume up here. Okay, it's up. So that's Rebecca messing around with the iPhone app. Um, all that sound is coming out of her phone. Um, but it's, it's sensing your lines or is yes. that? It's, it's, it's based on, so one of the things we wanted to do with the, with this piece of the project was to have people not only collaborate with one another um, by making sound together because it was an oval shaped room. So you could have people standing in different areas with their iPhones, creating sounds together, 
Um, but also the gesture that you saw Rebecca making there um, is, oops, is very similar to the gesture of um, making the design. Um, the way that we designed the app was to encourage people to move the way I move when I make these large wall drawings. Um, and there were there were a bunch of different sounds that she's she's um, demonstrating two of the different sounds that come out of the iPhone. Um, but there were, I think there were maybe eight major sounds and then there are large speakers in the room that did something else. So if you do download listening glass, you'll get a taste of it and you can you can scan anything with it and it, it works with edge detection and also it reads what direction you're standing in. So if you if you have your your dinner, if you scan your dinner facing one side of your kitchen, it'll make one group of sounds. And if you turn around and face the other side of your kitchen, it'll make a different group of sounds. So it's, it's, it's actually really, it's fun. And, and that was the intention to do something fun and engaging and interactive. Uh, this is a commission that I made for an IMP building here in Washington, DC. Um, and each of these paintings is about 15 feet tall and about nine feet wide. Um, and they're the same materials that I use with the um, site-specific pieces. So it's acrylic ink. In this case, it's applied to um, panels. And those actually, each one of those paintings breaks down into nine pieces. So each one of them being so tall, I couldn't have them upright in my studio. The, the ceilings in my studio are 12 foot. Um, so I worked on them on the floor. And the studio is just big enough that I could do one piece and then have it brought to storage and then do the next piece. So when we went to install it in the building, um, I had never seen any of them upright and assembled. And I'd never seen them together in the same room, which was a little bit terrifying, but I, I love the way this worked out. Um, so you had, the, uh, you had the canvases just on the floor? Were, yeah. They weren't yeah. stretched or they were, you had them stretched? They're actually, they're panels. Okay, okay. I mean, you can't really, it would, doesn't make any difference. I, I suppose I could have done it on unstretched canvas and then installed it that way, but I prefer to work on a rigid surface. So I chose to have them um, in a kind of modular format. So they were um, three panels across and three panels tall. And I would just kind of push them around on the floor in the studio. Um, so I just, this is a detail just so you can, sort of understand how they're composed. It's very simple. It's, it's you know, it's basically just little dots. Um, each of the dots are between a half inch and three quarters of an inch in diameter. Beautiful. So that triptych was kind of loosely based on this piece, um, which is in the collection of the Columbus Museum in Georgia. Um, but this did this wasn't made as a preparatory work for that larger piece because when I made this, that other project hadn't come to me yet. Um, but my work is somewhat iterative, and um, this piece grew out of that piece that was on the slide just before. So this is a much larger work. It's 79 inches tall and 54 inches wide. This piece is on mylar. The pieces in the IMP building obviously are, are on panels. They all have very different feelings to them. The marks in this, the little dots in this are tiny. They're like, you know, an eighth of an inch or so. Um, so it's sort of stretching the vocabulary, seeing what I can do with this very narrow vocabulary, seeing how much I can, how many different um, qualities I can tease out of it. And obviously the impact of standing in front of this work versus those five smaller pieces or the, the larger mylar piece, it's very different. Uh, this is a painting that I made in 2018, um, also on a panel. Um, and uh, it's about six feet tall. And the reason I'm sharing this one with you tonight is just, to, that's a detail, is just to talk a little bit more about some of my process. So, all the works are process-based. In the case of that painting, I actually had made this small drawing. This is 11 inches by seven and a half inches. And um, 
I was curious how this image would shift if it were up, upscaled. Um, so I projected this onto the panel and just used it as a scaffold. Um, so, you know, there's not that much information here once you blow it up to six feet tall, but you can see how totally different these two pieces are. So starting at the same point, but really going in different directions, which is pretty typical of my work. Less so with the wall drawings, because those works have um, a very limited period of time in which to install. I generally try and have a very clear plan going in, um, but the plans don't always work out. So I used to, when I first started doing the wall drawings, I actually um, reserved the right to have them painted over before the exhibition would open. And I would bring along other work thinking like, well, if I fall on my face and if this piece totally does not work out, then we'll just quickly paint over it and I'll just hang up some paintings and drawings. But that never actually happened. And by the time I started doing these in major museums, I had to kind of let that idea go. Um, and this is a, um, a small graph paper drawing that I made um, late last year. And dealing with slightly new vocabulary, and um, the graph paper drawings have been a part of my practice since the early 2000s. Um, they started out being serving as preparatory drawings, like serving as scaled preparatory drawings. Um, and well, actually, I should back up. They started out because I was traveling and I wanted to keep working while I was traveling. And because my work generally involves a lot of material, I couldn't work in my standard fashion. So I brought very limited materials with me, these graph paper pages and pens. And, um, and then they began to serve as preparatory works. And now it's gone back to this whole other body of work that is continuous and where I can work out some ideas on a small scale. A lot of them don't really turn into anything, but in, with this piece, this was the first piece that I did that had the, these orb shapes in them. And, um, and I've been working a lot with that um, iconography over the past few months. They've started to weave their way into larger paintings. Um, and so this is, I think this is the last painting that I finished before 2021 began. And I actually um, planted that circle. Oops, let me go back planted that circle. I think this somehow has a timer on it. Hopefully it won't keep skipping forward. Um, in the center and um, drew this um, central orb first. Um, and the rest of the composition developed around that. And um, it, pre it presented a lot of challenges to me along the way, but um, it was one of the more rewarding paintings that I made last year. So this is the last slide that I'm gonna share with you tonight. And um, this is a painting that I made when I was still in college. So I know that um, I'm speaking at a university and that's why I chose to share this with you. Um, the reason it's still an important painting to me is that it, um, it proves to me that I've been following a similar line of inquiry for all of these years. So um, to make this painting, I actually did not use a photograph. I, um, I stood in my studio with um, a jug, a bucket of water and, um, and just repeatedly scooped up the water and um, studied how it sat in my hands and how it felt and as the water would seep through my fingers. And then I would paint, and then I would do that again and again. I would scoop up the water, study it, think about it, and then paint more. Um, and um, it's interesting to me that I can see not just my dedication to process, because there was a much easier way to make this painting, and it would have looked more realistic. I could have taken a picture of my hands cupping water but it was the process of making it that really guided me. So I can see my interest in process here, but I can also see my interest in entropy, which it relates to the wall drawings that I'm making. So this sort of like 
this thing of, of creating something that is, is shifting and changing and can't be reversed and, um, and ultimately is ephemeral and only, you know, it's a situation that only exists for a, a short period of time. Um, so maybe I'll stop sharing my screen now. And if anybody has questions, we can. Well, well I do have, um, I had someone ask earlier, they were uh, reflecting on uh, the small pieces that you did with the books. Um, I'm sorry, I lost it. Uh, these windows into the soul are magnificent and perfect reflection of the pandemic isolation, which definitely, yeah. And you had shared with us that you had grabbed those on like March 13th. I think that's when the whole country pretty much went into lockdown and we were all scrambling to see what you could take home with you and, and work with. So I, those are, they're really beautiful. And then another person asked, the app is the listening glass. It's called listening glass. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And it's still up there and it should be free. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. I was, I mean, the, the, um, the Turner and Ruskin pieces really occupy a different space for me. I'm still exploring the ways in which they relate to the other work that I do. You know, the, the, I'm, I'm a, um, I, I am embarrassed to say that I collect more books than I can read. I start most days in the studio by reading, um, but I've never been a writer. I never took a poetry class. Um, I don't feel um, qualified to work with um, I don't really feel qualified to work with text, but somehow I felt qualified to work with somebody else's text. Um, so it's sort of like cheating in a way, I guess, but I, I'm going to continue. Um, I've actually started another project, um, another text reduction project. So I'm interested in, in the relationship between those works and the other pieces. I didn't include in the slides this evening, um, some graph paper drawings that I've been making that are much more geometric and they're actually based on the voids that are left from cutting out the text on those pages. And then I did a, a suite of um, woodblock prints um, that are also based on those voids. Wow, that sounds wonderful. Um, I have a question from Jennifer Prince. Time appears to be part of your, oops, I lost it again, appears to be part of your work, both in the making and the temporal nature of the wall drawings. Can you speak to that and why that is important to you? I mean, I think that um, we live, we live with the era of time in our culture facing forward always, can't go back. And we also live with this internal tempo that we're often unaware of. So just the other day, I was thinking about how crazy it is that we have a heartbeat. And I was also watching my two pets lying next to one another, the dog and the cat, and I was watching their them breathing. And it's really, I mean, we just take so many of these things for granted. And and if you actually stop and, and give yourself a moment to think about it, it's, it's, it's magnificent. So the, the, you know, time is one of those things that unites all of us and, and there's no getting away from it. So you might as well just lean into it and see how deeply you can explore it. And that's what I've been doing with the wall drawings. I did, when I, you mentioned that I did the fellowship at the Smithsonian, that was one of the things that I studied when I was um, a SARF fellow there, was um, I worked with a curator whose title is actually Curator of Time. Um, she's at the uh, Smithsonian American History Museum. Um, so it's something that, I mean, I think we're all, you know, we all think about it, but to greater or lesser degrees. And, and for me, it's, it's played a role in sort of the background of my practice for a long time. I, um, the first, well, it's really the second wall drawing that I made was made in my studio. Um, and I think I made it in around maybe 2003. Um, and so I just took all the 
other work that I had been making off the wall and devoted a 17 foot by 12 foot high wall of my studio space to this wall drawing. And um, some of my friends and family thought I'd lost my mind, but it just, I'm, I was very interested not only in this idea of creating something ephemeral for the, just making something for the sake of making it, but also removing myself from the craziness that is the art world, the sort of like unregulated commercial territory that most artists I know have a love-hate relationship with. And so that was that was a that was the impetus for the first wall drawing that I made, and it and it then a, it it showed itself to be a very good choice because I I found a way to work with museums that was that's very rewarding to to actually spend time in the museum. It's very different than when a museum acquires your work because I love having my work in public collections, but a lot of times it happens and I don't even know about it. And so there's something about contributing something to a collection that will always be there, but will ultimately be invisible to future visitors and, um, and spending so much time in the museum. It's a very special opportunity for an artist. I mean, I think it, it's also only very special um, curators will take that on because it's a big risk for them that they, you know, when they invite an artist to come and make a work, even, first of all, I've never been at, I've never been told, well, you have to tell, you know, you have to give us very clear information on what you're going to make before you begin installing. Like I always provide my preparatory drawings because I think that that's, it's nice to let them know what I'm, what I'm planning on doing. But, but they, the carriers that I've worked with have been so incredibly trusting and, um, and that relationship has been special. I don't, I don't know how often curators get to do that with artists. And I don't think that artists get to do that very often with curators. So I've, I've really cherished that. It's been one of the great things about making the wall drawings. Wonderful. That, I mean, I'm sure that the curators are taking a little bit of risk, but they know your work now, right? So they know your style of work. And I'm interested, you had mentioned earlier that you would go in with the, um, the little claws that if you didn't like the way it turned out, you would put something else up, but now you're just, you go with it. Yeah. And, and if there's, I see in your, your, um, your drawings, your preparatory works, there's a little bit of difference in what you're ending up with versus your, your, your it, it flows organically or you just. Yes. So I think, you know, in the case of a it varies a lot. In the case of the Hirshhorn project, because that was a 65 day installation and I estimated how long it would take to make the piece. And actually I finished two days early, but that's, you know, when you think about two days early on 65 days, that's like not a huge margin of error. And I didn't, I couldn't have gone over. And because it's a federal institution, I couldn't stay till two o'clock in the morning. So, you know, in the case of that project, my preparatory drawings, were really pretty nailed down. The, um, the piece that I did at the Bowdoin Museum um, changed while I was working on it. So I arrived with the, with the compositions that I thought I was going to work off of. And as I began installing, I realized that I needed to shift them a bit. And so I made a whole new set of preparatory drawings while wow. I was in the gallery. Wow. Um, but because, because I had enough time there, it didn't, it didn't throw the project off. And also you don't have to sit in the museum to make the preparatory drawings. So I could do that where I was staying. Um, and the, there was a project that I did at the Columbus Museum in Georgia that um, I, I I wanted to include pictures, but I didn't want to overwhelm you guys with too many images. Um, but it it's a large kind of geometric shape. And and then it has, and it's made with those little dots, like the um, the piece that was for the IMP building. And um, I had never done a wall drawing with that technique before. Um, so I'd worked at scale, but I hadn't done it on the wall. And I was nervous about it. I was nervous about... Um, like it taking a toll on my wrist. I was nervous about the way that the ink would behave on the wall because I hadn't used that particular tool before. Um, and then I actually ended up changing the composition a bit as I went along. 
Um, but it wasn't that far astray. So, you know, all of the work that I did leading up to the installation still served me really well. And then because I felt like I had a handle on the space, making those adjustments to the plan while I was there in the museum wasn't too difficult. I have another question. I'm curious to learn about why do you want the work to be erased afterwards? Um, I've seen how that element of the wall drawings um, affects viewers. Um, I've seen how unexpected it is, which, you know, there's plenty of other ephemeral work out in the world, but I think part of, part of why, um, why it affects viewers the way it does is because the works are installed in a contrast situation. So they're installed um, in a museum where you would never think of destroying a painting that's hanging on the wall or a sculpture that's sitting in the middle of the gallery. And um, when I've talked to visitors about it, it's, it's profound for them. And it's, for me, it's a way to kind of like constantly remind myself of my own mortality and, and of, of sort of the insignificance of things. Um, but I, I don't know if other people, you know, take it to that degree. But, um, but I do think that it gets people to contemplate um, permanence in a way that they might not otherwise in a museum setting. That's beautiful. I agree. I think um, I, you mentioned docents, I think, early. I'm a docent at PAM. So, oh, are you? So um, we, I haven't been in a while. But um, one of the things is when we have the site-specific works, and then it's taken down, and, and guests always, well, what happens to it when it's on the wall like that. And I'm like, it's just, it's gone. I don't want to say it's just torn down and, but it really is. And people, very hard for us not artists to understand that. I think I have a hard time with that. And I would think I would be devastated why, if I were you watching that. So um, I have a uh, Jennifer from Jennifer. So interesting to work with Ruskin as I think about your words and drawings, delicately dirty in the page. The cut word pieces appear to be gently removed with uh, leaving a delicate remainder. Remainder. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'd love to show you some of the um, graph paper drawings that I'm making with those. Um, I've actually started working with a much more difficult text. Um, I'm working with um, Mein Kampf. Um, and, um, Re reducing the text on those pages to just a few words. Um, I, I'm not sure what I'll do with it, um, but I thought it was important to explore a text that had a really different quality and different meaning to many people, because um, most people don't even know who John Ruskin is. Um, and um, Interestingly, I, I wasn't sure what it would be like to work with a very different kind of language. I mean, that's a book full of hatred. John Ruskin's book is, is full of, you know, it's, it's strange actually, because he, he sort of had his own love-hate thing going on with, with Turner. Um, but, you know, Hitler's words are, um, difficult to read and it's a it's a much more difficult project to do um, but um, I think um, reading a text for the purpose of identifying just a few words on each page and creating new meaning out of those words that's something that we don't really do and you know each of us reads in a different way and and we may have many different ways of reading ourselves. I know I do. Like I have, right now I'm reading, um, I'm reading, I'm always reading too many books at the same time, but I'm reading um, the Robert Gober book that was published by MoMA um, that's written by Hilton Ailes, um, which is a great 
text if anybody is looking for something profound to read. Um, and that requires a kind of attention, you know, to read his words and it's dense and rich. And then I'm also reading um, a book on maps. Um, it's not a, it's, it's, it's kind of a coffee table book, but each page has, um, has information on the map that's pictured in that spread. And so that's another way of reading, right? Because you're really reading the imagery and then secondarily reading the history of the map. So I'm, I'm thinking a lot about that as I work on this next text reduction piece, the way that we read and, and how we consume those words and how we process them in our minds as we're consuming them. Um, I have one more question and I'm interested in how, cause you showed your grad work, which was of the hands holding the water. Oh, that was undergrad. Undergrad, but, yeah, your yeah. undergrad work. And then how did you transition to the type of work that you do now, which is more um, um, abstract or yeah. How did you yeah. make that transition? That's a great question. Um, so the work that I did my, senior year in college, I guess I would categorize it as some sort of magical realism. Um, all of the works had recognizable um, imagery, so either figurative or landscape. I began moving more towards kind of magical landscapes after that. And then um, when I went to graduate school out in California, what I found was that um, working in that genre in landscape painting had a different meaning on the West Coast than it did in New York City. Mm -hmm. That to make landscape paintings in New York, you could play around with it as metaphor. But as soon as you made landscape paintings out in California, at least at that time, it was interpreted as a statement about the environment. And, um, and I think that that's wonderful, but that's not, that wasn't my intent. And so the, um, the professor that I was most closely working with in graduate school, whose name was Dennis Leon, um, we kind of had this conversation about that concern. And he encouraged me to make the same paintings without the horizon. And as soon as I removed the horizon line, it was like diving into the space. And I began to be more interested in the idea of a surround, which now that I'm making these site-specific pieces, it, it makes so much sense. Um, but it took me a long time to go from removing the horizon line and creating this kind of painterly surround to creating an environment in a, in a gallery. Um, so the works at that point, they had been these sort of atmospheric, magical landscapes. And then when I took the, the, the actual elements of landscape out, all I was left with was this atmospheric kind of space, implied space. And, um, and then I, I started becoming disillusioned with the idea of creating implied space, creating illusion which is kind of funny because my work has this illusionistic quality to it. And especially now with these new elements that I've just started adding. Um, but I really wanted the work to be process-based. And at one point the works became very flat because they were so process-based, all that was left was marks. And I was trying to flatten them out because I was uncomfortable with the idea of illusionistic space. But then I realized I didn't really want to make super flat paintings. I wanted to have it all. I wanted to be able to make work that was really engaged with process, but also somehow um, bring the light and movement and space, the things that sort of that we engage with as human beings every waking moment back into the paintings. And so um, I started making these um, process-based paintings that were, um, had kind of an all over quality to them. And um, over time transitioned to making drawings that had those qualities. And then, like I said, like I mentioned, when I did the piece at the Phillips Collection, became re-engaged with painting all over again because of the, of the work with the Van Gogh painting. Van Gogh. 
Yeah. Well, Lynn, thank you so much. Your work is fascinating. It's so interesting. Thank you for sharing with us all. I'm going to um, see if I can unmute everyone and give you a, a virtual round of applause. So thank you. Thank you so, so much. much. Thank, you. thank you. It was so nice uh, meeting you and hearing about your work. And maybe one day I'll get back to DC and um, see, get to do a studio tour. Yes. <laughs> studio yes. Tour. Yeah. So, That'd be great. That'd so. be great. Thank you again. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you all for being with me tonight and for, for listening to my story. It was really amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Good to see everybody. Thank you so much. Have a good night.